You could have all the talent, all the strength, all the speed, all the ability, all the training. And you could run a race to the finish line as best as you can. But you could still run a bad race. Technically, you could run all the facets of a good race, but you could still run a bad race. And uh, I don't know if you're into sports, but if not, you might have been familiar with this. I want to show a little video up here how somebody ran a race great to the finish line, to the end zone, but he ran it wrong. So Looking. Does. Stops, throws, completes it to Kilmer up at the 30-yard line. Kilmer driving for the first down, loses the football. It's picked up by Jim Marshall, who's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong way. His teammates were running along the far side of the field, Russ, trying to tell him to go back. You get my point when a good race is bad. I bring this to mind because of the fact that, as the Bible says, everyone runs in a race of life. And as we do this part three of our myth series, The Race of Life, I want to share with you the fact that you could be running fast, you could be strong, you could be gifted, you could be talented, and you could be running hard. But sadly for that guy, he ran in the wrong direction, in the wrong trajectory, in the, and as a result, he didn't help his team. He actually gave points to the opponent. And I want to share with you the fact that just because it's good, as we're learning, is not necessarily of God. God creates all good things. Can I get an amen to that, right? But how we discern good and what's not good we discern it from a superficial human fallen state. Because of that, what we see as an externally as good may not necessarily be good, or more importantly, may not necessarily be of God's best intentions. So I want to share with you the fact that I don't want any of you to be running and then at the end realize that just like that guy was running, if you noticed, um, if you see the larger thing, his teammates are running after him to try to stop him. But his opponents are running with him, too, to block out his team <laughs> from stopping him. The opponent players were like, keep running, keep running, keep running, keep running. And so in the same way, I don't want any of us as believers who are running a race that in the end you think you're running, but you may be not helping Christ's team. But the enemy might be encouraging you and protecting you to, so that you're going to score points for him and not for Jesus. So I want to share this from my heart because I really believe God brought you to this church for such a time as this because God wants to activate something glorious in your life. I really believe that. And I want to share with you just three points here today about how to discern whether or not we're really on the right track, right trajectory as we're running this race of life. So it's not just a good race but the right one. Can I get an amen, right? I want someone to say, you better run the right one. You better run the right one. You better run the right one. That's a tongue twister right there. The first thing that I want to share with you to differentiate is the fact that we have to see whether we're running a good race or God's race. Everybody say, good race. Everybody say, or God's race. Okay. What do I get this? It says here in verse 20, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. Back in the Isthmian and, and Corinthian games, back in the Greek uh, Athens games, they would, the winner would get a wreath that would fade away. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for a crown of righteousness that will last for eternity. So he's saying the author, Paul, is writing to these gifted believers in Corinth. As most scholars say, they're the most spiritually gifted and talented of all the churches. That's why he talks about all these spiritual gifts. They're spirit-filled in all of these things. And yet he's also reminding them, just because you have the gifts and the talents does not guarantee that you're doing the very best of God's will. And so he's challenging and encouraging them, you better run the race and you better run it right. And one of the things he's trying to point out, the difference between merely what's good or merely what's of God. And John Bevere in his book, Good or God, actually expounds on this. And it's something that I encourage you if, you, if you love reading, get a book on that. It really makes a clear distinction between what's good and what's necessarily of God. You see, God, good, we think of good 
from a superficial fallen state. Because we've all fallen in sin, what we measure goodness does not necessarily meet the standards of God's goodness. When God created all of creation, the first six days, God called it what? Good. But it was perfect. It was not just good. He called it good because it was perfect. But we're in an imperfect state, in a fallen state. So what we deem or think as good may not necessarily be meeting God's standard of good and perfection. So we have to understand that. That's why we need to be wise and discerning. Everybody say discerning, okay? We have to be spiritually discerning of things. Because just because externally looks good and, and is appealing and all that doesn't necessarily mean it's of God. For instance, if I eat a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts every morning because it tastes good. It may be good, but it's bad for my long-term health. If you love sleep, how many of you love sleeping? Raise your hand if you love sleep. If you get 18 hours of sleep every day, it's good rest. Can I get an amen to that? It's good, but you get 18 hours of sleep, you're going to get fired from your job, and you'll have no roof over your head. Just because something looks good to us doesn't necessarily mean that it's of God's very best. And that's something that we need to understand because I see so many of us falling for what we consider a good life. Let me challenge you. God called us not just to live a good life, but Christ's best life for our lives. Don't ever settle for such a, just a good life. Shoot for Christ, and he will elevate your life. It may not be rich, it may not be famous, but you'll achieve the fullest potential that God created you for. All of us were birthed with divine potential. And God ordained us to reach that. But the devil wants us not to reach that, but he'll be happy if you reach only 70% of it or even 80% of it, or even 90% of it. Because when you reach the fullness of God's will for your life, then you're going to bear so much fruit for his glory here on earth. So the devil will be fine. He's not just trying. He knows he can't stop all of us because we, he knows that we are victorious in Christ Jesus. So what he can do is, instead of stopping you completely, he will prevent you from reaching your fullest potential. You could reach 60, 70, 80, even 90% of it, but the fullness of it, he's going to try to stop you as a result. And we get this lesson from two things. One is when the, the story of Jesus and the rich young ruler comes, says, Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus, have you kept all the commandments? Yes, I have kept every single one. And then Jesus says this, that is good, but you still lack one more thing. Sell all you have, give to the poor, so you'll store riches in heaven. And then follow after me. And through this, the story goes that Jesus, the rich young ruler was disheartened because he was wealthy, and he walked away. He lived a good life, followed God's commands, but he was not willing to follow God. Let me give you a clear definition of biblical goodness. Biblical goodness is anything and everything that is submitted to God. Anything good that is not submitted to God is not really God's goodness. Goodness is anything and everything that is submitted to God. So what may look good, if it's not submitted to God, is not necessarily of God's very best. Are you track with me? Can I get an amen, right? And the second example I want to share is from Genesis chapter 3. You can put it up on the screen about how Satan comes and tricks and makes Adam and Eve fall into sin. It says here in chapter 3, uh, uh, verse 6, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good. Everybody say good. Okay? Saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. Isn't that good to seek? She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. This is the scene how, how Adam and Eve fell into sin. Life is perfect and good. It's perfectly good in the Garden of Eden. Sin had not entered into mankind. And as a result, God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And this is how good our God is a generous God. Can he get an amen, right? He's generous, and he gave Adam and Eve dominion over all of creation. 
I mean, I would love to be, uh, be on a time travel and travel back. Can you imagine Leo the lion's there? Come here, Leo. Comes. You're like wrestling with it. And it doesn't eat you. I mean, it's such a beautiful thing. And, you know, I, 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 I read that St. Augustine was so holy that birds would come and land on his arm like this. So I'm like, aren't I anointed God? And I see a squirrel. I, I do this sometimes when I'm like, hey, squirrel. <laughs> and then they run away from me, right? But think about creation being so beautiful in that way. And then Satan disguised himself as a serpent, who was a beautiful animal at the time, beautiful creative thing at the time. And he comes, and think about this. God is such a generous God. God said to Adam and Eve, there are thousands and thousands of different various trees with bearing fruit. You could eat from every single one of them. God gives freedom for everything except one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, don't eat that. If you do, you're going to die. But you could eat everything and anything else in all of creation. So life is good for Adam and Eve. But Satan comes, and he distorts God's word. Did God say that you can't eat of any tree? And then Eve's like, no, no, no. He says, we could eat of anything except for that one tree. And then, because Eve didn't know God's word, he says, but if we touch it, we're going to die too. God never said if you touch it, he says, don't eat of it, then you'll die. And then Satan is so good, he sways and moves Eve's attention from all the bountiful blessings of God and makes her focus on the one thing that is withheld from her. The one thing. God gives everything. But Satan makes you forget about all the blessings around and then says, look what God has withheld from you. And Eve saw that and and her attention got focused on the one thing she didn't have. Isn't it amazing? We're so blessed, but the one thing we want, but we don't have it, it just consumes our mind, doesn't it? You can't get your mind off it. So she forgets all these other beautiful trees that must, must have been so succulent, so sweet. I mean, I love pineapples. And the best pineapples I ever ate was in the Dominican Republic on a mission trip. And they cut that pineapple at the mission center I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I'm serious. It was that sweet, that succulent. Adam and Eve have all the best. Can you imagine creation was perfect? Every bite of every tree was so sweet. But instead of focusing on that, she's so focused. You're right, Satan. God gave me everything, but that one thing I don't have. And the more she focused upon it, it looked good. It looked pleasing. And it was desirable for wisdom. She justified it. It's good. I could have a happier marriage. I could have a happier family. I could have a better life. This is good for me. It's desirable for wisdom. And so because of that, what was good, she no longer submitted it under God. And she took it on her own. And then as a result, we fell into sin. Mankind has been dealing with the consequences of sin as a result. So that's why I want to challenge you. Let's open our eyes and be discerning. Point to someone and say, be spiritually discerning. Point to someone and be spiritually discerning. So I want to make the distinction. Eve saw what was good, pleasing to the eye, and desirable. But that's not the perfect goodness of God. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, the standards, the schema of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. And this is how the Bible defines it. Eve defined the good as good, pleasing to thy, desirable. But the word of God says, good, pleasing, and perfect. The perfect will of God. And, and the Bible is, is so simple and so clear to us. It even says in James chapter 1, we don't have it up here on the screen, but it says this, James chapter 1 says, don't be deceived. Point to someone next to you, don't be deceived. The writer of James says, don't be deceived. He says, every good and perfect gift, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. So again, we see the distinction. Just because it's good does not necessarily mean it's of God. It has to be under full submission to God. And anything that's under full submission of God is good and pleasing and the perfect will of God. Are you track with me? Can I get an amen? That's why the Bible says, I have blessed you singles with so many talents and gifts. But I withheld sex until marriage. 
for your own benefit. Because when it's used under the submission of God, then you're going to have health as a result of that. Or you try because the mechanic get an amen to that. That's why God says, everything you do, submit. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your whole body to God. Submit it to the will of God. Then you'll see that you're running the right race of life and running not just a good one, but God's very best with you. And my challenge and desire for all of you is simply this, that you will not just live a good life, but you will live the very best life that God has called you to do. Don't just settle for a good job. Settle for whatever God has given you and make the best of it, and God will elevate you as a result of that. Don't just settle for this and that. Submit everything unto God. Not my, my will, but your will. Is this the best job for me? Is this the best location for me? Is this the best church for me, God? Nothing here on earth is perfect because you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Jesus Christ alone is perfect. But he has a perfect plan for our lives. And God's perfect will happens in our imperfect environment. God uses weak things to shame the strong and the foolish things to shame the wise and the things that are not to shame the things that already are. See, that's how God is such a generous God. And he's saying, I believe he was speaking to me when I was studying this passage. Stephen, tell my beloved people, don't fall for the good life that the world is telling us to pursue. They think, they're telling you, if you pursue this, you're going to be happy. You're going to be content. You're going to be comfortable. You're going to feel secure. Can I be honest with you? We live in Irvine here. There's an increase in burglaries. I don't care what home you live in. It's nothing safe. But if God is watching over your house, better than ADT, better than bring, I don't know what security companies there are these days. But if you have security by the Holy Spirit guarding your home, no foul thing will enter that place because you've made it into the house of God where Jesus dwells. So just because it's good doesn't mean it's necessarily submitted to God. Make sure you submit your life to Jesus Christ. That's the first thing that we see here. Is it a good race of life that you're living or are you living very God's very race, the best one for you? The second point I want to share with you is the fact that we need to understand about how we're supposed to fulfill God's thing in our lives. The second point is we got to win this race by pursuing God's dream. Everybody say pursue God's dream, okay? Point to someone next to say, God has a dream for you, pursue it. Point to someone, God has a dream for you, pursue it. Now, if you believe that, somebody shout amen, right? Amen. God has a dream for you. When he created you, he knew your name before your mother and father would ever have known your name. And he mapped out your life. He knew from the first moment you were conceived in the mother's womb to your last breath here on earth, he mapped out and he dreamt a glorious, good, perfect plan for your life. It was a purpose. It was to bear glory to God's name. And he had that. And that's why we have to discern what's good or what's of God. But how do we pursue this dream? One of the reasons why so many Christians get frustrated and they drop out of the race or they stop running whatsoever or they leave church or they leave ministry or they leave God, having faith in God, which is such a tragedy, is because of their wrong expectations. They think that God's dream is a destination. It's not a destination. Let me be honest with you. God's dream is a journey of destiny, not a destination. What good is just getting there? God allowed our lives to be able to live how many years and decades so that we could make that journey into a lifestyle of living God's dream. I want to challenge you in the best loving way that I can. Whatever season you're in, you're, that season is part of God's destiny. And it is replete, it is full of divine potential and fruit. You may be in a harvest season, you may be in a winter season, but if God placed you there, it's fulfilling God's destiny. And we need to not get discouraged by that because I see so many people pursuing God, but they think the dream is once I get there to the promised land, then it's good. No, you get to the promised land, but there is a destiny to fulfill. He doesn't want you to just get there to the promised land. He wants you to fulfill God's purpose in the promised land. There's a world of difference as a result. So God's challenging all of us to pursue God's dream. How do we win it? Just not by trying to get there, but by trying to get there by making the journey a lifestyle. 
of pursuit. Dream that dream in whatever season. Make it a lifestyle. It says here, so I run with purpose. Everybody say purpose, okay? In every step. Everybody say in every step. Paul didn't waste a single step of his life. He didn't live aimlessly. He walked and lived with purpose in every step. And that's the same thing that God calls us to do as well. We're supposed to live God's dream by making it a lifestyle. Because so many of us don't enjoy this journey because we just want to get there. My wife is the exact opposite. If you ask her, she says, I love long drives. <laughs> but I correct her in my loving way. I say, no, you don't. You love long rides <laughs> while I drive. <laughs> and when you see something, oh, look how beautiful it is. I'm like, Why you? you should always tell me, no, what? keep your eyes on the road. I can't even enjoy anything. She gets some, sees something funny on Facebook. What, and they, oh, what is it? Keep your eyes on the road. She's texting. Who are you texting? Keep your eyes on the road. So I tell her, no, you love long rides <laughs> while I drive. <laughs> but so many of us are impatient like kids. Are we there yet? <sighs> How much further until we get to San Francisco, Dad? Three more hours. <sighs> And they miss the beautiful gas stop stations. <laughs> when you go to the restroom, get some icy drinks, pick up some popcorn or whatever, chips. You miss those moments, those rest stops. That's when you guys actually end up getting spiritually dehydrated because you miss out on the moments. If you ever run a marathon, I've never run a marathon. I always wanted to. I thank the Lord for Brother David Ma. Big shot to David Mine. <laughs> Triathlons, marathon, and swimming, and biking. Yeah, 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 okay. Let's see how we do up in heaven, all right? I'm just kidding, all right? But uh, I'm happy for him because he's found his gift. I found my gift. And I can't run a marathon because the doctor, because of my heart condition, you can never run a marathon. But one of the things I want to challenge you on is simply this, that when you actually find your dream that God's given to you, I know that you, uh, Revolve Singles were so blessed yesterday, gathering together with uh, uh, um, uh, Brother Rich and uh, Brother Jeff Sarabandon. Did I say your last name right? Okay, all right, praise God for that, all right? And uh, you guys are looking for calling and destiny and all that. And you know, if God hasn't revealed it to you yet and you're seeking him, it's not the right time. Seek him. Not necessarily. If he hasn't shown you what you're supposed to do, just keep seeking him. Because your dream cannot be fulfilled by your gifts and your talents alone. Your gifts and your talents are only aids to fulfill and glorify God's purpose, but it's God who fulfills the dream. Only God gave it, and he planned it so only God can fulfill it. So pursue God in that way. But I want to challenge you because you need to discern when you're seeking God, and there will come a time where God will give you his clear calling and dream for your life. But I want to ask you to just be discerning of three sources of the dream. Sometimes the dream is from within. Everybody say within. You get it by yourself, and you want to do this. You want to do that. It's within. So it's self-motivated. A second type of dream is without. Everybody say without. Okay. So without is somebody else gives you a dream. Tells you what to do. Parents, I'm going to say this out of love. Don't try to fulfill your dream through your children. I should have gotten a loud amen from the youth, but they're scared right now to say that. God has a specific plan for your child. Challenge them to find it and run after it. But sometimes we try to live out somebody else's dream. It's from without. And then the third type of source of the dream is from above. That's from God. So within, without, and above. When you're seeking a dream and God gives it to you, because it started from God, God will finish it. And I want to challenge all of you to pursue that dream, even though you go through mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. Because as I mentioned uh, to, uh, last message on this series, that it's not just a marathon, it's an Ironman triathlon with various things. But as you go through up and down and different gradients, I want to encourage you in this way. God is such a generous God. On the mountaintops, you experience bliss and happiness. But it's in the valleys 
that God develops your faith and your character. We enjoy the blessings and the energy and the strength and revival of God on the mountaintop, and he takes us to mountaintops. But then after the mountain, there's always a decline. You come down to the valley. And it's in that valley, that's why the Bible says, what? Suffering produces what? Perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. So you have to understand that God knows what he's doing. And some of us get discouraged after we reach a mountaintop. Thank you, God, you're doing something amazing. Then he takes us into the valley like, where are you, God, in my life? But remember this. If you're following God, you may, not, you may just be caught up in your own perspective. I'm just going up and down. But in God's perspective, you're going up. You're just focused on, am I going up? Am I going down? Am I going up? But in God's perspective, he's taking you up. He's elevating your life. So that's what I mean. Did you get so discouraged you miss out on the blessings of the journey? Can I challenge all you married folks? God's season for your marriage in every season, whatever you're going through, if it's not filled with joy, if it's not filled with hope, you're not living the way that God asked you to live it. Do you think God's will is, I would like that couple to suffer? <laughs> think of the D word, not devil, but divorce. Yeah. Hey, Gabriel, angel, <laughs> my good and pleasing and perfect will is for them to like, ah! that's no depiction of us, okay, my wife and I, just, just FYI, okay. My wife and I, we do get into arguments, but we always make up, and my wife always goes, and I give her a peck, and then we say, look, kids, and the kids are like, oh, gross. <laughs> but God wants you to enjoy every season. Students, oh, I have to study so hard. It's so hard to get into UC school these days. You need 4.5 GPA. I mean, I never heard of that stuff when I was growing up in college. I'm going up to college. But now it's gotten so hard, and you got to run, run the rat race to try to make it and all that. Wherever God leads you, it's not the school that's going to make you become the man or woman of God. If you study this in many ways, God uses the weak things that came from nowhere places. So the location is no limitation to the will and the grace and the power and the anointing of God upon your life. Don't ever discount something. You think the big and the impressive things are there. God speaks to the still small voice sometimes instead of the earthquake, instead of the wind, instead of the fire, but to the still small voice of God. So you need to understand and trust in God and make sure that you discern, is my dream from within, without, or is it from above? And then you need to discover, what are my gifts? Everybody say gifts. I was praying this morning, and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Stephen, this church, but the people have enough gifts already to turn the world upside down. I'm not just saying it to make you feel good, or right, trust me. I, I really heard it from the Lord. The Lord just spoke and said, Stephen, tell my people that in this room there are so many gifts and talents and abilities that if they surrendered everything to God, they will win the race that I've marked out for them. And together, you win for the team Jesus Christ. If you've never done track and field or cross country, you don't get this because in this you think like Paul saying, you got to win. So only one person wins the prize. That's in the human race of life. But in God's race of life, God's called you and gifted you with your unique ability. And all he cares is not about coming in first or second or third or 20th or 50th or whatever. He wants you to run to the fullest potential. Some of you will never have the potential to finish first place. And that's okay. God gifted you people accordingly differently. That's why swimming, there are, there are fast sprinters, there are intermediate, and there are long distance. Same thing in marathon. There are long distance runners, there are medium distance runners, there are sprinters. Same thing in biking. If you do cycling, there are the sprinters who do real well in the speed trials. And then there are the intermediate ones, and then the long distance ones. And God has gifted all of us to fit in this race of life for God's kingdom with the unique gift that God's given to you. Some of you 
are short distance runners. Some of you are medium, some of you are long, and you may be some of you good in that in swimming or, or, or running or biking, whatever the event is, but God's gifted you uniquely for that. And all he asks of you is to finish so you don't come in first place. You're not competing with one another. You're competing and overcoming the obstacles, the sin and the obstacle that easily entangles us. And you run the race that God set for you. And when you finish it to your fullest potential, you may not have come in first, but if you've ever done cross country, they take the total tally aggregate of your team members as they all finish in their respective timing. And when it's all tallied up, if your team ran its fullest potential, that aggregate sum, total, is what determines the team is winning or not. So in the same way, don't think, oh, man, because I didn't come in first, you think you're a failure. Or you came in last, God has abandoned me. No. Know that God's given you the race. You're not competing with the person to your right or to your left. We're not competing with other churches. We're all on the same team. And this church are going to attract smart people and good-looking people because my wife is smart, and she's also good-looking as well. You thought I was going to say that about me, but I know better than that. And other churches will travel, but we're all in the same team. What good is it if we're growing and another church is dying? It's all about the aggregate sum, so we're cheering each other on as a result. So find and discover your gifts. And find how do you discover your gifts? I'll tell you what. Nine out of ten times, you're never going to find your gift by doing this. Show me my gift, show me my gift. Pastor's texting you. Can you be willing to serve in this area? No. Show me my gift. Show me my gift. We need some small group leaders. And we feel like you're really bi- biblically knowledgeable. Will you serve? No. Show me my gift. Show me my gift. Show me my gift. As one person said, it's really hard to change direction when an object is not moving. How do you discover your gifts? You know how you discover your gifts? You love God, seeking him. And the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor. So you serve. You bless. You know how I discovered that I don't have the gift of singing? I tried. (laughs) Trial and failure. Trial and failure. And so I realized, okay, I don't don't have the gift of leading worship. But there was a six-month period that I did lead worship. And it developed character and faith in the valley, okay? But it's amazing God used the weak things to change the strong. And so how do you learn your gifts? Because you got to try. Don't be afraid to try because God honors effort more than just inactivity and passivity. And we'll help you to discover your gifts. And what a beautiful thing it is to see Jennifer Singing and using her voice for the glory of God. Sister Esther, you know, she, you know, she has, has a second child now. I heard from Pastor Sam that she's never sang like this before We're in a worship team context. And how she's using it for the glory of God. What if she decided, oh, what's my gift, God, what's my gift? And she never tried it. You have to try it. And then you go to discouragements. Can I go a little deeper? God eliminates and closes doors when you're constantly seeking and knocking and asking for God's will. And you get so discouraged, the devil comes and says, see, God's withholding good from you. See, you should give up on God. But what you don't understand is God's leading you to the exact place and the giftings that he's called you to do. One author was sharing about how he was trying to run a marathon and he realized he was dying at the end. And then he realized that he was better in the 800-meter runs he's more of an intermediate and God had gifted him for that and so he started to do that he didn't come in first he came in third or fourth and he got some medals for that but then he realized this is my element this is my gift and he only found out by trying marathons trying sprints and then finally trying an intermediate and he discovered the zone that God had gifted him in how many people here are so gifted and talented and some of you need to discover it and it happens by trying The greatest failure, as you heard, is never trying. And I want to encourage you, make it a lifestyle now. Because in this room, I pray as the Lord spoke to me today, I said, Lord, activate all these people in this church. 
We have realtors here. Can you imagine you have the power of the Holy Spirit? You go to that home that you're about to show. Bam, I claim it in Jesus' name. <laughs> if you're in construction business, I pray that every nail would be like the nails of Jesus that hung him on the cross. There is leading mercy and grace upon that building right now. If you're a teacher, can you imagine, because you have the Holy Spirit, you come into a room, you change the atmosphere in that classroom. Where students come home, come to school beaten because school is the only refuge. You come and you bring the presence of God and you scare out any devils that are trying to lurk in that place. Can you imagine if you start to be activated and using your gifts, how we can change things for the glory of God? Are you trapped with me? Can I get an amen to that? So point to someone next to you and say, don't make it a destination. Live it now as a lifestyle. Say, live it now as a lifestyle. Live it now as a lifestyle. By the way, I'm keeping on track. We started late today, so I was, I was preaching here at the quarter of, by the way. But the third point I want to share with you is the fact that um, winning is not about beating the other person. It's overcoming the circumstances and the, and the situation obstacles that the world's throwing at you from reaching your fullest race and potential God's best. But the third thing is, are you living a good but aimless living, or are you living for God's eternal purpose? Everybody say eternal purpose. And this is where I want to close, and this is where I want to share my heart with you. Though our church is in our third year, and God has really blessed it. And I'm thankful for the Lord. From my wife and I getting God's call to start a church, praying, not asking a single person, but then people gathering and coming together on their own, saying, I feel God's called you to do this. With doing this, and I'm not boasting. We did this without any local church or denominational support because God's clearly told me, from back in the summer of 1991, I know some of you singles were not even born then. Ezekiel 17, I myself will take the very top of a cedar and I will myself will plant it on the mountain heights of Israel and become a large cedar tree and birds of all kind will find shelter and, and rest in it. And I had that vision of a multi-ethnic church. And we're getting there, slowly but surely. So... But I realized God makes a dream happen. What I can do is just continue to pursue God. And the Lord spoke to my heart in this way because um, I want you to get this. I know you come to church and God blesses you and touches you through the worship and the word and all that. Praise be to God. And you're finding community and all that. That's just half of it. The other half is our mission. We don't just come to have community and to be blessed. That's good. Can I get an amen to that, right? But submitting that to the will of God means we have to do it for a purpose. Can I remind many of you people that joined us within the last year, year and a half? You joined because we were staying on point to our mission, to reach new people. And you would not be here if somebody didn't invite you. And to hear your email saying, I'm so thankful I found community, that breaks my heart. I mean, in the, not in the wrong way, okay. I'm happy, okay, for you. That just, but it breaks my heart that there are people that are spiritually homeless. They don't have a church family. They're lost. They're being beaten around by the enemy. And I want to challenge you as I close with this because it says here, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. We're living our lives to hone our gifts and use it for the glory of God, for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. I want to read, we live for the glory of God, use our gifts in our lives, run the race for God's glory, but that's not enough. God is already glorified. He doesn't need our praise. His praise up in heaven is perfect. But he asks us to glorify him. What do you ask us to do here on earth? Not just to glorify him, but to live to expand his kingdom. His heart is for a neighbor or your neighbor who doesn't know Jesus. And he's saying, I died for that person too. And I placed you there to reach out to them. Oh, pastor, it's so scary. Who cares if they reject you? At least you can go before God and say you did. And this is what I want to leave you with. As I was praying this morning, looking over my notes, God showed me a picture and he said, Stephen, one day, you're going to stand before me up in heaven. And I want you to picture this. I'm going to stand before my Lord Jesus Christ. 
when my time is filled here on earth. I'm going to see Jesus in his beautiful, radiant glory. And he's going to look at me and he's going to say, my son, you accepted me as your Lord and Savior back in eighth grade. And so you're saved by grace, by faith. And so therefore, you're going to come into heaven. And I'm going to be so happy. And all the angels and all the men and women of faith in the Old Testament, New Testament, they're going to be there. I can't wait till I see Moses. See whether he looks like Charleston Heston or not, you know, in the Ten Commandments. Look at Peter. Say, man, you were some impulsive guy. Look at the Apostle John and say, man, you were pretty proud to say, I am the disciple that Jesus loved. You want to see all that? And they're going to be applauding when every saint comes home. Can you imagine? I think that's why it's a celebration. It never stops. Every day someone dies and is going to heaven. An angel in heaven is erupting. Another child has come home. And I can't wait till I be with my Lord because he is my first love. He gave his life for me. I gave my life to him. He said, I surrender. Please forgive me. Be my Lord and Savior. And then he said, you're now a child of God, but now you're also my minister. You're my servant. And I decided I'm going to live my life, the rest of my life, for the kingdom and glory of God. It doesn't mean you have to be in full-time ministry. All of you are called to be ministers of God. And one thing the Lord spoke to me this morning is this, Stephen, when you come up before me and I'm going to say, you accepted me, you're going to go to heaven, I'm going to then ask you, there's a, there is a judgment of the believers, not of going to heaven or hell because we're going to go to heaven because of faith. He's going to judge us according to what we did with what God has given to us. And if I say to God, God, I lived a nice life in Orange County, California. God, you blessed me with a wonderful home. Blessed me with a wonderful, beautiful wife. And marriage. I, you blessed me with two wonderful kids. You blessed me with a car that I could drive around and get gas in Costco. I was a good steward of it, God. I lived comfortably and I enjoyed going to the beaches. Don't get me wrong. Those are all good things. I'm not saying don't do those things. I live financially secure, or I try to live financially secure. I, I, I do all. And God's going to say, that's great, but those were blessings that I just blessed you with. Did you live for my kingdom and its increase? Just like I died and bled for you to be saved, did you live your life to help others to come to that saving knowledge? I want to be able to say, Lord, I used everything I can to expand your kingdom. And then the Lord spoke to me that this morning and said, teach my people and tell them to live for something greater than mere happiness or comfort or security. Tell them to live radical lives for Jesus. Do you know how far God can take you in your gifts and your potential? It only happens when you live your life fully submitted to God's best grace for you. Don't settle for the good life. That's the lie of the devil. And Eve saw it. So pleasing, so tempting. And she ate it. But today in our generation, let's be like King David. I was at a purpose-driven conference with my staff this week. It's one of my favorite verses. Pastor Rick put it up there in Acts David, King David, fulfilled the purpose of his generation. After he fulfilled it, he died and went to be with God. My challenge that God's given to me is to make sure all of you, each and every one of you, as long as you're at this church, my stewardship is to help you to live your life for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to live for his kingdom, not just to come be blessed on Sundays, but so that every Sunday the kingdom of God is literally advancing and growing. If we don't reach new people, we will just become a Christian country club. Comfortable. Oh, the coffee is so good here. The food is so good here. All the blessings are a means to an end, and that is to fulfill and expand your kingdom. The blessings are not the ends. 
the gifts and all of these things, the blessings are a means to an end so we reach more people for the kingdom of God. And there is so much potential here. Singles, your name is right. If you revolve around Jesus and submit to his will, you're going to become, I prophesy in this room, God's going to use, some of you think you're the weakest and the most foolish and the most ignoble. God's going to use you to shame the strongest and the wisest in this world. You youth, give your heart to God. Give your dream to God. You don't even know what it is. Maybe it's to play PS3 for five hours. I don't know. Give your heart and your talents and gifts to God, and God will take it, and he will fulfill his word to you that you will be faithful and finish that work. To you, Mary folks, your best years are still ahead, not behind. You're not over the hill. Because age is no limitation to the promises of God in our life. Abraham, Sarah, David, all of them waited until a much later time, and then God used that and fulfilled his dream for their lives. So as I close, I want to ask you to do this. The worship team is going to come on up. Some of you had dreams that have been waiting upon or broken upon. I want you as a step of faith today, as we praise, I want you to do a bold declaration step of faith. I know we rarely do this, but this is something that I felt the Lord was pressing upon my heart, saying they need to step into their destiny. As the worship team is going to be leading us in a song, I want to ask you to really think about what is the dream that God's given to you? Are you waiting for it? Is it tearing? The Bible says, though the vision tarry, wait for it, for it surely come to pass. Now I want you to take a step of faith, every single one of you. You don't have to come here to sh as, a, as a show, a sign of religiosity. But what I want you to do, think of this front as an altar of God. And I want you to come, if your dreams are broken, just like that person who was so discouraged, what is my gifting? I tried all these different races, and he surrendered to God, and God allowed him to discover it. I want you to place your dream, whether it's broken, whether it's whole. If you don't know your dream, offer your gifts and your talents to God and say, God, from this day forward, I want to live not just for a good life, but God's purpose for my life. You do that as a sign of dedication, as a sign of covenant today. I just felt it in my soul when I was praying, Stephen, I will meet them there, and I will let my dreams be fulfilled in their lives. Are you ready to make that covenant with God? Should all stand with me at this time.